Hello, everyone. Uh, today we are at the BC Care Providers Association and Engage BC Energy Savings Program webinar. So today's webinar is on site power generation and cooling systems. We organize this webinar for our members uh, across British Columbia, uh, helping them understanding about the new trends and uh, technologies uh, coming in the market and how we can support them being energy efficient and help them in other cases such as cooling and heating systems. Next, please. Today's agenda, we will be going through the uh, introduction, then we'll be directly hitting on the technologies that is gas powered heat pump, heating and cooling, combined heat and power system, electric heat pump, which is heating and cooling a cane, and then we'll be open for question and answer session. So today presenters are Jeff Hogwild from Kelvin International INC, uh, Kenneth McNamee from Impact Engineering, Paul Benovito from uh, Kelvin uh, International INC. Uh, I will acknowledge this uh, time to, uh, it, I, I would like to take this time to acknowledge that uh, we are presenting and uh, people are attending this uh, webinar from unseated and ancestral territories of Muskiam, Squamish, Slivetut nations. We are grateful to live on these lands and work. Uh, moving ahead, uh, we'll be starting ahead uh, with uh, the gas-powered heat pump and handing over to Jeff from here. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate this. Uh, again, with me today is Paul Bonato of Gullivans. Uh, just a quick little sidebar about Gullivans. They have 17 locations throughout the province of British Columbia to meet all your renewable energy needs, uh, everything from renewable energy solutions to emergency readiness, power backup, solar, and then electric heat pumps and combined heat, so that's just heat power systems, as we'll talk about. Um, we're going to look at two products as Abhijit introduced. Um, uh, and different ways of using natural gas to reduce consumption, as well as decrease your <clears throat> electrical loads. Um, as a follow-up at the end, um, we welcome the opportunity for your organization to work with Kenneth and us uh, to see if there's a suitable solution uh, for your organization. So as we talked about, we're going to talk about uh, gas heat pumps and how they vary with electric heat pumps, because a lot of people seem to be unfamiliar with um, gas heat pumps. Basically, uh, the overall difference with the gas heat pump, it's how it's, how it's powered. A gas heat pump uses a gas engine to drive the compressor, whereas an electric uh, heat pump uses an electric motor. Both systems, use the same compression cycles and functionality as all heat pumps. And uh, just as a little footnote, gas heat pumps have been around since the early 90s and typically really used in Europe, Asia, et cetera. Here in North America, ideal in cold climates, as I will explain uh, later, such as Canada. Um, the installation is no difference between a gas heat pump and an electric heat pump. Um, the only basic difference is that an electric heat pump is three pays and the natural gas heat pump is connected with natural gas. Internally, it all uses the same uh, equipment. Here's your outdoor unit. It could be electric or gas. It's gas in this picture. Your indoor fan coils, your hydronic baseboards, your in-floor system, et cetera. They're all the same for, uh, for both units. We both use standard piping for refrigerant or hydronic piping. Hydronic is for hot water. And your control system, whether it be an, a, an internal room thermostats or <coughs> building control system, is exactly the same. I have given uh, a picture here. Your indoor units, they can hang on the wall. They can be in the ceiling. They can be in the floor. The piping, whether it be refrigerant or hydronic, again, is exactly the same. The point that I'm trying to make here is that the contractor doesn't need to do any special skills for any of the gas products that we're going to talk about today, the gas heat pumps or the combined heat and power systems. Uh, if they meet all the warranties and permits throughout the province. The big benefit of a gas heat pump 
is the waste heat recovery. It eliminates the defrost cycle, and the defrost cycle is the ice buildup on the unit in the winter time. The COP of a gas heat pump is a lot better than an electric heat pump during the winter months. Um, and primarily it's because with the heat pump recovery technology, we scrub the heat off the engine jacket and the exhaust, and that keeps the heat exchanger warm. It prevents freeze up or frost buildup while maintaining space heating to the building. It never turns off the space heating. Electric heat pump turns off space heating to keep the heat exchanger warm. The heat exchanger to be non-technical, it prevents the ice buildup on the unit. If we use renewable fuels such as renewable gas, hydrogen, we're carbon neutral according to all the utility standards. Energy resiliency is another big uh, point that I wanna point out. As we're at 90 80%, 70% of natural disasters uh, cause power outage. Uh, and as we found out with the past experiences last year, our gas solutions have been far more resilient than our electrical solutions, which increases occupancy, stability, security, health, and safety, especially in your environment. There obviously is reduced operational costs, because gas, as you're well aware, is significantly less than electrification. But more importantly, all your gas uh, heat pumps are single phase connections. So they use 90% less electricity. I only need enough power for the fan and for the control, that's it. Uh, again, we avoid peak demand. So when everybody's using electricity for their electric heat pumps, you're only using gas, so you avoid the peak demand, you avoid the peak uh, demand billing or any pe penalties. Combine heat and power systems. I'm gonna talk about a quick intro, talk about the main features and uh, what we can do to see if it's good for your system. Combi CHP, which is also an abbreviation for combined heat and power, it's also known in the industry as cogeneration or cogen and it's the production of both hot water and electricity. Typically in your buildings, you have a boiler that creates hot, hot water, and then you pull electricity from the grid. Well, this small little machine that can fit inside your mechanical room, and they're pretty small nowadays, or outside, combines these two independent functions into one system. So we got the electricity, and then we got the hot water. And this sits right in your building, inside or outside. Um, how it works, it's powered by renewable gas um, or biomass, as I'll touch on later, or natural gas. This powers the motor that runs the generator. And that gives you, just like solar does, the electricity for your building or your facility. Any excess electricity can be stored in the grid or in some provinces like Alberta, it, it falls under the uh, micro generation order can be credited back to, to um, your account. Just like with the heat pump, we scrub the, the heat off the engine jacket and the exhaust and that creates ample, a, a ton of hot water, which can, you can use for your laundry service, your showers, your kitchens, et cetera. More importantly, your water temperatures are a lot higher than your heat pumps. They're not 115, they're not 140 degrees. We get up to 175 and 190. And on your return, you're typically losing five to 10%. Cooling is easily done with the chiller as I will point out earlier, okay? So these CHP systems um, have been designed for residential and commercial applications. Just to give you a visualize, visualization, sorry, I'm, <laughs> my Dutch is getting in front of my English. Your typical building, like I mentioned, has a gas supply to give us our heating, electricity from the grid. Your boilers are anywhere from 80% efficient to 97% efficient. I've seen some at 60%, but that's a really old system. Your grid is as supplied and, and as you know, in peak demand, we're buying power from our neighbors, including Washington. So that sometimes is we're buying dirty pile and you have line loss. So there isn't a little bit of emissions. 
when we reuse renewable gas, for an example, this unit here, as I just articulated, this is what it looks like. It provides both the heat and electricity to the, to the building. Uh, and on average, your efficiency is anywhere for both of this, 88 to 95%. So we're zeroing out the emissions, we're increasing the resiliency, which gives us um, occupancy sustainability, stability, emergency readiness, and of course, the low cost of operation and energy storage. Um, I put this slide in to give our mechanical people a schematic of an electrical diagram, very similar to a solar, in solar installation to where we have the solar and then we have an auto transfer uh, switch for when we want to switch from solar, uh, we can use the solar power during the day and then go back to grid power at night. CHP system works exactly the same. So again, a lot of your electrical contractors are uh, would be uh, quite familiar with the uh, installation process of how to install a CHP system. Um, here is an example of a hydronic application. Here we have the uh, hydronic application. Here we have um, your system connects just like a boiler. It's providing the space heating. Uh, it's providing the hot water for the showers, for the laundry service, et cetera, et cetera. And we could also use, just like a boiler, we could use it uh, for the swimming pools or for the spas, the hot tubs that are in your senior care facility, facilities. Combined heat and power is also able to connect and create cooling, which is also which is known as tri-generation. And I hopefully I'm not using introducing new words to your vocabulary, but these are true words. It stands for combined cooling, heating, and power. And again, we're using the hot water and connecting it to a water fire chiller, which creates our cooling, cooling loops. It's very important that if you're doing heating right now with baseboards and fan coils and they're not set up to do cooling as well, you will have to upgrade your fan coils, et cetera, to accommodate both and or uh, put in a four pipe system, et cetera. I like to give pictures of the units. So here's a picture of two 20 ton chillers. Again, uh, not a big footprint and can easily fit into any mechanical room. So you could have a CHP system here and your chiller here is subject to your to uh, your building. So this is CCHP. Um, Yamar makes three different, uh, four different units: a five kilowatt, a ten kilowatt, a thirty-five kilowatt, and a twenty-five kilowatt. Um, the five, the ten, the thirty-five all run on renewable gas or uh, natural gas. The five and the ten which target really like remote communities, uh, people offsite in rural areas, they can also run off of propane. Um, the 25 kilowatt, it works off of biomass. And yes, you can connect them. And what, that I, what, that I, what I mean by that is I can take two tens and make 20 kilowatts. I can take four 35 systems and make 140, 140 kilowatts. Uh, I would do that because um, I have, uh, I need a greater load. Uh, I have different loads, uh, load springs during the seasons, et cetera. And, and this, we can answer questions later on and when to combine the units because we're limited to time here. Um, I pointed out some key benefits about uh, this, the CHP systems. The, the, the number one thing is we work here in British Columbia, uh, renewable gas has done a significant thing for, for gas powered solutions, especially renewable sol solutions. And here's a chart from Fortis giving us the CO2 uh, rating of, of um, renewable gas versus electricity, but we can net zero using renewable fuels, which is my point. So renewable gas or hydrogen will help us meet these uh, net zero targets easily. We spoke about the cost of of gas, renewable gas. And as you can see, it's two to three times less than electricity today. Um, another peak benefit, as we talked about earlier, is the supply of natural gas. 
helps us avoid issues during peak uh, demand or additional billing rates. But more importantly, uh, occupancy, stability, health, and safety. Uh, electrification, EV charging, et cetera. As we push here in the province and across Canada and globally, the electrification of everything is placing a huge demand on our current infrastructure. A combined heat and power system not only secures continuous power, but it also secures hot water supply and it protects your facility and your clients during power outage, power outages, and much more. Um, energy readiness and emergency power. I'm familiar with uh, senior care facilities, nursing homes, um, extended health care centers, et cetera. And traditionally, there's a lot of backup power. A CHP system is a good addition and or substitute. Um, as we talked about, it's on-site energy generation at the point of service, your building, you know, right next to your building. So whether it be a retrofit or a new construction, I say retrofits because we can get those hot water temperatures, those high hot water temperatures, and new construction, we have lower hot water temperatures such we, as we use it in floor heating. Um, the emergency readiness when the power goes out because of um, poor weather or natural disaster, not only do we have electricity to keep the lights on, but we also have the hot water for the kitchens, the showers, laundry, et cetera. But more importantly, we reduce the cost of our current standby generators, uh, the fuel storage, or any ongoing uh, maintenance, including the emissions that we burn when we run these units monthly. Additionally, uh, we can integrate uh, the CHP system with any solar PV, solar thermal, or other solar solutions such as winds. Um, as I showed you earlier, in the piping and electrical schematics, it's easily integratable. Uh, it's, 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 it's standard within practice. A huge advantage to the CHP systems is that they're whisper quiet. And sorry, I was hesitating there because I want to use the word, we could install them next to a balcony. They're that quiet. They're quieter than my voice right now. They're quieter than a new dishwasher. Um, as you can see with this chart here, their small footprint allows them to be put inside and we can have the mechanical room next to the other common areas in the building. So again, outdoor, indoor, indoor installation, unlike a solar system, it only requires closet space, not a whole rooftop. Um, flexibility, scalability, again, all these units can be hooked up together. This, this example here is about uh, 700 kilowatts. And there's a reason why they would use uh, multiple system versus one main system. And for the simple one is when we repair it or to service the CHP and we turn it off to service it for safety, et cetera, then the building doesn't have any power or electricity. So having two units, et cetera, allows one unit to keep on running to meet the building loads while we tend to the service of the uh, second unit. One controller can control up to 16 units. Yamar prides itself on its reliability and durability. It has one of the world's best warranty. For those that don't know Yamar, they are an engine manufacturer. They were the first in the world to make a small diesel engine, et cetera. They have one of the best and longest warranties. And um, the, the service cycle is so small. It's for every 10,000 hours. And when my wife asked me, what's 10,000 hours? That's like 300,000 miles before we do an oil change on your car. We also have remote monitoring with alert notification. So know about the problem before the problem occurs, which ensures reliability, longevity, not only of the system, but also of the of the of the the total operation your current equipment because you might incur it interconnect them in a hybrid installation um a big thing here is here's our traditional generator it's standby power it's been built to to make backup power yamar makes these units the generac system yamar makes the engine for the generac system 
it's a standby application, okay? It's meant for standby uh, use. Uh, CHP system is designed to work, and I'll say this twice, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The more you use it, the more efficient it is. Your typical ROI on a CHP system is three to seven years, creating both hot water and electricity and can be used as a backup uh, resilient energy source. So we always send to the engineers like Kenneth, when sizing the CHP to zero the load, whether it be hot water or electricity, it's not standby power. It's meant to run in front of the, <coughs> the boiler. In closing, is a CHP or a gas heat pump right for your facility? If you're downtown Vancouver, if you're in Abbotsford, or if you're in Prince George, those are all different environments for a heat pump to work in. If you're in anywhere in the province and you have uh, a heavy uh, thermal load combined with your traditional commercial load for electricity, a CHP system is, can be easily be right for your, for your business and really reduce your current natural gas consumption. So prior to this, you know, Abhijit, uh, Kenneth, um, and uh, our stuff from, from Gullivance talked about how we could assist you. So Abhijit will talk more about if your building falls at, or is interested in something like this, this is something we're willing to explore and answer your questions with. Um, Lastly, the video that's the, the this is going to be shared with you. So, Paul and Jeff's my con contact information there. But here's a video on it. I've got lots of videos on combined heat and power and gas heat pumps. So, I've included a link which is like two or three minutes long, would do a lot better job than what I've just done. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Jeff, uh, now Kenneth will take over, take ahead from here uh, on electric heat pumps, and uh, yeah. So Kenneth, you can you can start with us. Yeah, thanks, Jeff and Abjit for an introduction. Uh, thanks everybody for joining the call this afternoon. Uh, yes, yeah, so today I'm, my name is Kenny. I'm with uh, Impact Engineering here in Vancouver, um, and. Yeah, I'll just give a little bit of a talk about um, building overheating and cooling requirements for buildings, um, kind of based on what we're seeing uh, over the last couple of years, um, and also how to tie in incentive funding to achieve cooling in buildings as well. So next slide. Um, yeah, so that's just a summary. This is our team here. So. Uh, as I said, we're, we're based in Vancouver, we're an engineering consultant, um, but we, our approach is to um, factor in efficiency, building systems efficiencies, and low carbon systems into our designs. So we work a lot with the utilities, with BC Hydro and Fortis BC, uh, to bring incentive funding to support equipment replacements for retrofit projects. Um, and a lot of our focus is on uh, installation of heat pump systems, which have the dual benefit of providing cooling and also reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so in terms of actual building requirements for cooling, um, as many of you know, healthcare facilities are mandated for cooling and it falls under CSA guidelines for the provision of cooling. For multi-unit residential buildings, um, that is not the case. So um, there is no code requirements for cooling in multi-unit residential buildings. Um, so many of the facilities uh, that we that we see on the long-term care side of things uh, from the 70s and 80s don't have any cooling incorporated within the facilities and can tend to overheat during summer conditions. So I was doing a bit of research during the week, um, just in preparation for the presentation here, and I came across um, this news article in the bottom left, um, which noted all-time records again uh, this year, 2021 temperatures and 2022 temperatures. Um, and out of, out of my own interest as well, I, I, I checked to see what the BC building code requires in terms of um, summer design temperatures during summer. Uh, and as you can see for in comparing um, the temperatures that we're seeing in summer and then also the design condition, um, the actual temperatures that we're seeing are, are, are much in excess of the actual BC building code requirements. Um, and again, this is factoring into building overheating. Uh, the picture at the top there actually was from 2021, uh, and it was a cooling center that was established in Vancouver, 
uh, for people in, uh, in residences that didn't have cooling uh, who needed to take shelter. So, um, so what is overheating? It's overheating is, um, and, and uh, temperature is somewhat subjective. It all depends on, on, uh, on the profile of the inhabitants of the building. Um, one person may feel hot at 26, 27, and that might be comfortable for other people. So it is quite subjective, but um, the city of Vancouver has um, tried to define uh, overheating requirements for, for buildings. And using ASHRAE standards, um, they have come up with a, a measure of how, whether a building is overheating or not. And essentially, it's, uh, they state that the building cannot exceed specified accessibility limits uh, for more than 200 hours per year or 20 hours for vulnerable populations. And as you can see in the table below, um, those are the temperatures. So take July, for example, at 26.9 degrees Celsius. Uh, that's the acceptability limit for temp internal temperatures in buildings during July. Um, and again, the takeaway from this is that um, uh, what we're seeing is that, especially for vulnerable populations, uh, long-term care facilities, that uh, we're exceeding those 20 hours uh, of overheating in buildings uh, during summer conditions, especially as we see the climate uh, warm up. Uh, and I know this is a very local uh, this is a very local uh, update, but the city of Vancouver itself is, is requiring uh, cooling for all new multifamily buildings, uh, residential buildings beginning in 2025. And we're seeing this happen in the city of Vancouver, and we expect to see this happen uh, across the province as well. And essentially, it's, uh, the, the code updates are there to uh, tackle the, the overheating requirements or the overheating uh, prevalence in, in, building, in residential buildings. So, uh, so we know what the issue is. Um, so then uh, where, where we are often engaged uh, by our clients is to perform an options analysis to say um, what type of systems are there to, we can install and implement to help provide cooling for our buildings. And also have we the ability to bring funding to help support those retrofits. So um, as I said, uh, we, as I mentioned, we work with Fortis BC, we work with Clean BC and BC Hydro. Uh, to get incentive funding to, to come into a facility and perform an energy study. Um, and essentially, it's a, it's a building systems uh, study uh, where we evaluate the performance or the efficiency of the existing systems and then make recommendations, uh, cost-based recommendations to uh, retrofit those systems with higher efficiency uh, op options. Um, and often when we look at facilities where, where greenhouse gas emission reductions is a priority, uh, you, we install heat pumps. It also has the added benefit of providing that cooling. Um, often an optional scope that we also provide is overheating analysis using an energy model. So we're able to determine um, how hot the, the facility will get during summer uh, at different climate conditions, at different temperatures, uh, and model passive design techniques like uh, shading, uh, like operable windows, and then model also the HVAC systems to, to make sure that we can meet those overheating requirements that are set out by ASHRAE. And then finally, um, based on that information, based on that assessment, we, um, you know, we, make a, we make a recommendation on a heat pump system or HVAC upgrade, and then secure capital incentives to also support that. Um, yeah, so this is like often an optional scope that we're asked to, to look at. This is a overheating energy model using IES. Um, and again, we build the actual building in the model, um, which takes into consideration building envelope uh, or values, window or values, heat gain uh, through the glazing. Uh, and we assess what areas of the building is, it tends to overheat uh, and to what extent the entire building overheats. Then we model strategies, like, a, like I mentioned, passive cooling strategies, such as operable windows or shading, to see what benefit those have, and then look at actually right-sizing the cooling system. Um, and this is really helpful because not all areas of a, of a building will overheat at the, same, at the same rate, depending on the orientation of the sun, the time of day, whether the shading. So this is a really uh, cool way of uh, addressing the, uh, the hot spots within the building. Um, so more in detail in, in terms of the incentives that are available. So again, primarily we work with Forest and Clean BC. Clean BC is a provincial 
um, is a provincial program. It's administered by BC Hydro, and their mandate is to reduce um, natural gas consumption uh, or electrify buildings. Whereas Fortis are more focused on renewable natural gas technology and on efficiency, basically improving efficiency of, of systems. Uh, so Fortis, when engaging for an energy study, they offer up to 75% of the energy study costs up front and an implementation bonus of 25% if, if any of the measures we identify are implemented. So essentially, the, the, the energy study can be free uh, if any of the measures are implemented. And they also provide in capital incentives of $3 per gigajoule over the life of a measure. So different systems will have a different expected life cycle, like a boiler, maybe 24 years, and they're handing in it maybe 20, 21 years. Um, so we, 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 cap, we calculate savings or capital incentives based on that. Uh, CleanBC offer 50% of energy study funding up to $20,000. And then they provide incentives then based on greenhouse gas emission reductions uh, over the lifetime of the measures that we identify, whether that's heat pumps, rooftop or source heat pump rooftop units or whatever. Um, so in terms of some of the solutions that we often uh, identify when went on site and speaking with our clients. So uh, some of the heat pumps, uh, distributed heat pump systems that we often see uh, are uh, in-suite heat pumps. So these are new HVAC units in the, in the photograph on your left. So these are um, integrated heat pump units. So we don't have a split condensing unit that is located outside of the, outside of the uh, room. Um, there are two six inch uh, penetrations in the building envelope that brings air in and then rejects air out. And these, that unit does heating and cooling. Um, the only key difference really with the next system, the split DX system, is that you have that outdoor unit which, which needs to sit outside. And then you have a split, uh, split unit which is inside the, inside the room. And then more traditional type PTAC units uh, on the right hand side. So there are, there are real, some real key benefits with having uh, distributed heat pump systems. Um, minimum disruption to building tenants during installation is one of the key. You can, you can go on a room by room basis um, and you can schedule it effectively. Um, it provides individual sweet temperature control, which is which is which is a nice uh, nice to have. Uh, it provides uh, high efficiency heating as well as cooling, so again has the added benefit of reducing GHGs. Um, and typical costs we're seeing, obviously, this is dependent upon sp site specifics that could be elaborated on in a study, but we're seeing typically ten to fifteen thousand dollars per suite uh, per retrofit for these types of systems. So then the other, on the other side of things, we have the potential for central heat pump systems. Uh, so the unit there you'll see on the left-hand side is a rooftop unit, um, heat pump yeah, unit, which does typically does um, heating and cooling electrically uh, with, a, with a backup, either electric resistance coil or gas backup. Um, this, these, these systems are probably the most straightforward in terms of actually getting cooling into the building because um, you can replace uh, like for like essentially rooftop units. <clears throat> now they may have an additional electrical requirement or structural requirement, um, but those impacts tend to be tend to be minimal. Um, for larger uh, facilities, like more on the healthcare side of things, I would say um, we have also looked at uh, heat recovery chillers, where we can grab heat from exhaust air and use that to heat the building. Um, in the wintertime and then summertime provide chilled water to supply coils, ventilation coils within the, within the building. And we have a lot of success actually in larger facilities with this type of system. Uh, and then uh, just tying into Jeff's previous uh, presentation on the BRF system, uh, we often look at um, gas and electric driven uh, BRF system. And as Jeff mentioned, the only real difference between the gas and electric often is the, is the fuel source. Otherwise, um, everything else is pretty consistent throughout the building. So, can I um, just add one thing? Yes, go ahead, Jeff. Um, you can take a VRF gas heat pump and tie it into uh, a rooftop unit a a as well. The, um, there is a interface if if there if that is to quickly add cooling at an affordable price structure. And then the other thing is there are gas absorption heat pumps that quickly do uh, um, domestic hot water and heat loads. But sorry to interrupt. Thank you. Oh, that's a good. That's a good point, um, Jeff. As well, yeah. So <clears throat> and there are many um, gas-driven uh, heat pump technologies that are available. Um, often, where we see the most applicable is whenever we're approaching 
um, electrical capacity on buildings. Uh, upgrading electrical capacity is one of the most costly uh, parts of getting cooling uh, or heat pumps technology into the building. So a lot of those buildings I mentioned from the 70s and 80s were designed, were not designed electrically to have cooling. So that's where these types of gas heat pump technologies uh, may, 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 may make sense as well. So that's a good point, Jeff. Um, yeah, so and that kind of leads in here as well. So when, when looking at the building retrofits, we're often challenged by, I suppose there's three key challenges. Um, one of them is structural capacity. Where do we put the equipment? If we put it on the roof of a facility, we need to beef up the structure uh, on, on the facility, whether that's you know, gas-driven heat pumps, air source heat pumps, ventilation units. Um, it's often a key consideration. Uh, like I mentioned, electrical capacity as well is often, we're often constrained uh, by electrical capacity. So when we look at heat pump options, it's one of the things that we identify early on in the process. Uh, and again, this is where if we're exceeding the, the electrical capacity or close to exceeding it, uh, then there are gas technologies that can help um, navigate that limitation. Uh, and then also looking at existing systems. Um, we often as well, when we're retrofitting existing systems that have um, already pre-existing, like coils are sized for certain uh, hot water temperatures or cooling water temperatures, uh, there are certain limitations within the existing systems within the building. So we often look at uh, the right system choice to meet the existing uh, building system uh, functionality as well. And yeah, I hope um, that was a good high level overview of uh, some of the things that we look at. And um, yeah, I'll hand it back to Abjit and if you guys have any questions. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff and Kenneth, for explaining uh, the the uh, members who are on the call with us for the webinar and the members who will be listening to this on on their own time from the website. Uh, so today we covered the uh, combined heat and power generation, which can be done on site. We can generate electricity and domestic hot water on site. Uh, then we have covered the gas absorption heat pumps, gas fired heat pumps. And, uh, and which is very useful for our members because I would say majority of our members are, uh, are, are having the heating uh, on gas and going electrification may be tougher for them to increase their electrical capacity and getting into, uh, getting into electrification side. So those who can't and they, so we have an, we have an excellent option for them. Uh, for doing uh, heating through gas, which they are already doing, but we can do cooling as well through gas. And then we have uh, cooling through electricity as well, which uh, Ken just uh, mentioned through uh, electric heat pumps. So at this point of time, we can open call, uh, open uh, for questions uh, if any of our members on call would like to ask or any attendees would like to ask. Uh, yeah, we can. We are open for questions, please. Right. So I think we don't. We don't have any questions, and I have checked chat as well. Uh, we don't have any questions in chat. So we'll we'll close this webinar here, and the recording will be available on website. Uh, the energy savings program. And uh, I'll be submitting this with all our members so that they are posted with, uh, with the knowledge sharing what we have done in this webinar. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Kenneth. Thank you, Paul, for being on this call. And thank you, all the attendees, for being on this call. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, for setting it up. Good job, Kenneth and Jeff. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. guys. Thank you.